Good day to you all and welcome to this first day of April. It is day 91 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name is Hunter. I am your brother, your Bible reading coach, someone who shows up with you every day to spend some time together in the pages of the Bible. And we're going to let the Bible do what it does and point the way, my friend, to the one who has the words of life. And so we come to him from all around the world. We gather to warm our hearts by the fires of God's love. For God is love. Full stop. No qualifications needed, my friend. It's simply true, and it's something that we can simply rest in. Today we are in the book of Judges, chapters 11 and 12, and then on to Psalm 50, And we'll finish in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is the word of the Lord. Judges chapter 11. Now Jephthah of Gilead was a great warrior. He was the son of Gilead, but his mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also had several sons, and when these half-brothers grew up, they chased Jephthah off the land. You will not get any of our father's inheritance, they said, for you are the son of a prostitute. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he had a band of worthless rebels following him. At about this time, the Ammonites began their war against Israel. When the Ammonites attacked, the elders of Gilead sent for Jephthah in the land of Tob. The elders said, Come and be our commander. Help us fight the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to them, Aren't you the ones who hated me and drove me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? Because we need you, the elders replied. If you lead us in battle against the Ammonites, we will make you ruler over all the people of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders, Let me get this straight. If I come with you, and if the Lord gives me victory over the Ammonites, will you really make me ruler over all the people? The Lord is our witness the elders replied. We promise to do whatever you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him their ruler and commander of the army. At Mizpah, in the presence of the Lord, Jephthah repeated what he had said to the elders. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of Ammon, asking, Why have you come out to fight against my land? The king of Ammon answered Jephthah's messengers, When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they stole my land from the Arnon River to the Jabbok River and all the way to the Jordan. Now then, give back the land peaceably. Jephthah sent this message back to the Ammonite king. This is what Jephthah says. Israel did not steal any land from Moab or Ammon. When the people of Israel arrived at Kadesh on their journey from Egypt, after crossing the Red Sea, they sent messengers to the king of Edom asking for permission to pass through his land but their request was denied. Then they asked the king of Moab for similar permission, but he wouldn't let them pass through either. So the people of Israel stayed in Kadesh. Finally, they went around Edom and Moab through the wilderness. They traveled along Moab's eastern border and camped on the other side of the Arnon River. But they never once crossed the Arnon River into Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. Then Israel sent messengers to King Sihon of the Amorites, who ruled from Heshbon, asking for permission to cross through his land to get to their destination. But King Sihon didn't trust Israel to pass through his land. Instead, he mobilized his army at Jahaz and attacked them. But the Lord, the God of Israel, gave his people victory over King Sihon. So Israel took control of the land of the Amorites who lived in the region, from the Arnon River to the Jabbok River, and from the eastern wilderness to the Jordan. So you see, it was the Lord, the God of Israel, who took away the land from the Amorites and gave it to Israel. Why then should we give it back to you? You keep whatever your God Chemosh gives you, and we will keep whatever the Lord our God gives us. Are you any better than Balak son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he try to make a case against Israel for disputed land? Did he go to war against them? Israel has been living here for three hundred years, inhabiting Heshbon and its surrounding settlements, all the way to Aror and its settlements, and in all the towns along the Arnon River. Why have you made no effort to recover it before now? Therefore I have not sinned against you. Rather you have wronged me by attacking me. Let the Lord who is judge decide today which of us is right, Israel or Ammon. 
but the king of Ammon paid no attention to Jephthah's message. At that time the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he went throughout the land of Gilead and Manasseh, including Mizpah and Gilead, and from there he led an army against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. He said, If you give me victory over the Ammonites, I will give to the Lord whatever comes out of my house to meet me when I return in triumph. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. So Jephthah led his army against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave him victory. He crushed the Ammonites, devastating about twenty towns from Aror to an area north of Minith and as far away as abel Karamim. In this way Israel defeated the Ammonites. When Jephthah returned home to Mizpah, his daughter came out to meet him, playing on a tambourine and dancing for joy. She was his one and only child. He had no other sons or daughters. When he saw her, he tore his clothes in anguish. Oh, my daughter, he cried out. You have completely destroyed me. You've brought disaster on me, for I have made a vow to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. And she said, Father, if you've made a vow to the Lord, you must do to me whatever you have vowed. For the Lord has given you a great victory over your enemies, the Ammonites. But first, let me do this one thing. Let me go up and roam in the hills and weep with my friends for two months, because I will die a virgin. You may go, Jephthah said. And he sent her away for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never have children. When she returned home, her father kept the vow he had made. And she died a virgin. So it has become a custom in Israel for young Israelite women to go away for four days each year to lament the fate of Jephthah's daughter. Chapter 12 Then the people of Ephraim mobilized an army and crossed over the Jordan River to Zaphon. They sent this message to Jephthah. Why didn't you call for us to help you against the Ammonites? We are going to burn down your house with you in it. Jephthah replied, I summoned you at the beginning of the dispute, but you refused to come. You failed to help us in our struggle against Ammon. So when I realized you weren't coming, I risked my life and went to battle without you, and the Lord gave me victory over the Ammonites. So why have you now come to fight me? The people of Ephraim responded, You men of Gilead are nothing more than fugitives from Ephraim and Manasseh. So Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and attacked the men of Ephraim and defeated them. Jephthah captured the shallow crossings of the Jordan River, and whenever a fugitive from Ephraim tried to go back across, the men of Gilead would challenge him. Are you a member of the tribe of Ephraim? they would ask. If the man said, No, I am not, they would tell him to say, Shibboleth. If he was from Ephraim, he would say Sibboleth, because people from Ephraim cannot pronounce the word correctly. Then they would take him and kill him at the shallow crossings of the Jordan. In all, 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time. Jephthah judged Israel for six years. When he died, he was buried in one of the towns of Gilead. After Jephthah died, Ibzan from Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He sent his daughters to marry men outside his clan, and he brought in 30 young women from outside his clan to marry his sons. Ibsam judged Israel for seven years. When he died, he was buried at Bethlehem. After Ibsam died, Elon from the tribe of Zebulun judged Israel for ten years. When he died, he was buried at Ajilon in Zebulun. After Elon died, Abdon, son of Halal, from Pirathon, judged Israel. He had forty sons and thirty grandsons who rode on seventy donkeys. He judged Israel for eight years. When he died, he was buried at Pirthon in Ephraim, in the hill country of the Amalekites. Psalm 50, a psalm of Asaph. The Lord, the Mighty One, is God. He has spoken, he has summoned all humanity from where the sun rises to where it sets. From Mount Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines in glorious radiance. Our God approaches, and he is not silent. He devours everything in his way, and a great storm rages around him. He calls on the heavens above and on earth below to witness the judgment of his people. 
Bring my people before me, those who have made a covenant with me by giving sacrifices. Then let the heavens proclaim his justice, for God himself will be their judge. O oh, my people, listen as I speak. Here are my charges against you, O Israel. I am God, your God. I have no complaints about your sacrifices or the burnt offerings you constantly offer. But I do not need the bulls from your barns or the goats from your pens, for all the animals of the forest are mine. And I own a cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains and all the animals of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for all the world is mine and everything in it. Do I eat the meat of bulls? Do I drink the blood of goats? Make thankfulness your sacrifice to God, and keep the vows you made to the Most High. Then call on me when you are in trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will give me glory. But God says to the wicked, Why bother reciting my decrees and pretending to obey my covenant? For you refuse my discipline and treat my words like trash. When you see thieves, you approve of them. And you spend your time with adulterers. Your mouth is filled with wickedness and your tongue is full of lies. You sit around and slander your brother, your own mother's son. While you did all this, I remained silent and you thought I didn't care. But now I will rebuke you. Listing all my charges against you, repent. All of you who forget me or I will tear you apart and no one will help you. But giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. If you keep my path, I will reveal to you the salvation of God. 2 Corinthians 1 This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. I am writing to God's church in Corinth and to all of his holy people throughout Greece. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, It is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stop relying on ourselves and learn to rely only on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. We can say with confidence and a clear conscience that we have lived with a God-given holiness and sincerity in all our dealings. We have depended on God's grace, not on our own human wisdom. That is how we have conducted ourselves before the world and especially towards you. Our letters have been straightforward and there's nothing written between the lines and nothing you can't understand. I hope someday you will fully understand us, even if you don't understand us now. Then on the day when the Lord Jesus returns, you will be proud of us in the same way we are proud of you. Since I was so sure of your understanding and trust, I wanted to give you a double blessing by visiting twice. First on my way to Macedonia, and again when I return from Macedonia. Then you could send me on your way to Judea. You may be asking why I changed my plan. Do you think I make my plans carelessly? Do you think I'm like people of the world who say yes when they really mean no? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you does not waver between yes and no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Timothy, and I preach to you. And as God's ultimate yes, he always does what he says. For all God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. 
It is God who enables us along with you to stand firm in Christ. He has commissioned us and he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he promised us. Now I call upon God as my witness that I'm telling the truth. The reason I didn't return to Corinth was to spare you from a severe rebuke. But that does not mean we want to dominate you by telling you how to put your faith into practice. We want to work together with you so that you will be full of joy. For it is by your own faith that you stand firm. And now, Lord Jesus, we ask your blessing on the reading and the hearing of your word. Amen. Given the option, I'll rely on myself every time. Given the choice, I'll hold on to control with the death grip until I reach the point of death. (laughs) My guess is you know that grip well. Well, God wants us to go beyond the death grip and utter self-reliance and move us into something entirely new, a life of dependence and trust in his presence. It appears in 2 Corinthians that God allows us to go through these near-death experiences in order to break our grip and open our hands to his. Paul says that he thought he would never live through the difficulties he was experiencing. He said it was so bad he expected to die. The purpose of these experiences was that he would learn to stop relying on himself and rather to trust in God who raises the dead. In other words, we learn to rely on the power of the resurrection, the power of Christ's presence with us, in us, to release our grip and hold on to him. There's no escaping suffering in this world. And I wish that I could fully explain the meaning of suffering in our life, but I can't. But what I can do in the face of suffering and its reality is to look to the one who came and suffered with us and for us, that he might give us hope beyond our suffering, that we might even have joy and life in the wake of our suffering. And God is still doing that, even today. He's still suffering with us. That's the nature of love, to suffer with. The word compassion literally means to suffer with. God is the self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering one. That's the nature of his love. And when this love meets you at the deepest level, at your deepest loss, in your deepest shame, in your deepest wounds, he begins to mend you and to heal you. And not only you, but those around you who are suffering. That's what Paul described here in verse 6. He said, for when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. If you're suffering today and you have a death grip on those circumstances, open up your hand to his. Experience his love today and let him begin to heal and mend and to make you new. That's the prayer that I have for you today. May it be so. Well, hey, hey, dear ones, you can find out more about what's going on here at the DRB by going to our website, dailyradiobible.com. And if you're interested, you can find out information on our upcoming trip to the Holy Land come September, September 5th through the 15th, and there's still room on that bus. We'd love for you to join us. So hop on over and check it out and register today. And on this day, I want to thank some folks that have partnered with the DRB to make this podcast possible. This ministry is entirely listener-supported, and partners like these are what makes it all possible. So a big thank you to Becky Hutton, Dr. Renee Gum, Teresa Okala Oji, Craig and Shelby Hildall, Florence Atiega, Vanessa Kaufman, Sandra Bush, and Carmen Sanchez Rios. Blessings, my sisters and my brothers, co-laborers in this important work. 
And to others out there who are interested, if you would like to partner with us, that is so needed and so appreciated. And you can do that very simply by heading over to the webpage, dailyradiobible.com, and clicking on the donate link. Well, hey, we've done it. We've done it again. We've spent another day in the Bible, and I plan on being back here again tomorrow to do it again. Lord willing and the creek don't rise, your brother Hunter plans on being here. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this, that you are loved. No doubt about it. All righty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care. Bye.